Thanks, Jeff. Cool. So, um, before we get into your work, I want to know, we, we went through quite a thing with COVID. You know, the last three years really did its number on us. How did you survive that time period? And how has it changed the way that you do things now? That's a really good question. I, you know, I, I rather enjoyed it in a way. Um, it, you know, it stopped all performing and all, uh, all recording for, you know, for the foreseeable future for me. And um, what it allowed me to do was to take care of this ever-growing stack of projects that I wanted to do, this record being one of them. And uh, I didn't have to learn music. I didn't have to rehearse. I didn't have to uh, prepare for performances. So I just I used used that time to catch up on projects. And for instance, you know, work nearly a year or two on the orchestrations in this in this CD. So uh, for me, the pandemic was a time to sort of uh, catch up and reassess. Um, and uh, I must say, I rather like, we were stuck in LA during the, the whole pandemic and the lack of traffic and the yeah. birds in the air and the blue sky were all a nice change. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. Which is not to say oh, there was a lot of suffering involved with it for a lot of people financially and physically, but, um, but artistically, it was a, a really nice break for me. So one of those projects you're speaking of is the Richard Rodney Bennett, the, the, you know, getting into his head, the 10th year anniversary. What was that like? What was this project like? Well, you know, uh, both Claire and I were, uh, and Jill Graham, the producer of this record, were, were among Richard's uh, closest friends. And, and when he died 10 years ago, of course, we were all devastated. But, you know, we did some, I did memorial concerts in London and in New York at the time. Uh, and uh, BBC broadcast uh, for his 80th birthday. But Claire and I, for years, had talked about wanting to memorialize the jazz side of Richard Rodney Bennett. Um, he's really well known in England as a classical composer, choral composer, opera composer, ballet composer. And of course, you know, he was this impossibly accomplished figure because he also scored 50 films and from the time he was a student, he was playing in jazz clubs on the weekends. And so, um, you know, his, his classical output is pretty well recorded and acknowledged and uh, his film output, of course, is it's all there. All those scores are there, Murder on the Orient Express and all of that. But Claire and I wanted uh, to memorialize the, the, his jazzy side. Claire had been his singing partner the last 12 years of Richard's life. And um, Richard had been the one who introduced me to the American Songbook and to Vernon Duke uh, in a more extensive way. And so we wanted to uh, sort of memorialize what he was like as a jazz artist by doing a recording of, of uh, his favorite songs to sing and play as well as, as a number of songs that he'd written, uh, either the lyrics or the, the tunes for. Uh, which we both think should be better well known. And so that was the idea here. So I'm curious, what do you hope the listener gets from your interpretation, from your your work on this? What do you want them to get from this project? You know, um, it's it's a, you know, the recording is 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 a bit old school with these huge orchestral accompaniments and so forth. Um, it uh, and what I want them to get from it is is the is it sounds stupid, but just the sheer beauty of it, uh, it just a respite from the the drudgery of everyday life, and just go into this very special place that is so beautiful. Um, Claire singing. Uh, is so soulful and uh, so inventive. And I just wanted to give her a, a backdrop that was uh, as varied and as lush as possible. The, uh, uh, but, you know, I, when people listen to this record, I just want them to be transported for a minute and to, 
into another world. So how did this journey begin for you into the music? Where were you born and raised and how did the influences and how did this happen for you? Well, Joe, I was, I was born and raised in Iowa, actually. Wow. <laughs> uh, up and uh, in, in rural Iowa, almost up in Minnesota. Um, and I, it's a, I don't really know. As a seven-year-old kid, I started asking for violin lessons. We had no musicians in our family. Uh, we had a piano in the basement. And of course, living in rural Iowa, there was no violin teachers to be had. Yeah. So I, I started piano lessons and uh, I uh, had this amazing teacher who was in Fort Dodge, Iowa. And she introduced me to classical music when I was about 10. And I was just obsessed. And I was playing with concertos with Midwestern orchestras by the time I was 12 all over. And uh, so I, uh, I, I, I was taken with music from then on. I uh, was a, not to digress here too much, but I, I got very freaked out by the competitions, you know, all these international piano competitions, which I thought was my way to a, the career I wanted. So I uh, actually dropped out of music for a few years, went to medical school and completed a residency and internship in eye surgery and was actually practicing uh, medicine uh, in uh, LA when I met Leonard Rosenman, a very famous film composer who thought it was nuts. I wasn't having a career in music. And so with his encouragement, I actually entered a few competitions and won, went back to New York, uh, got a master's at Manhattan School, met Richard and uh, made a Carnegie Hall debut with the Vernon Duke piano concerto that Richard found for me and helped me orchestrate. And the rest is history. Wow. So what was the first live show that you ever saw that blew you away? First live show? Yeah. That's really interesting. I mean, uh, I think, frankly, uh, when I was a, like a freshman at, at uh, at the University of Iowa, Keith Jarrett came. Wow, and that's heavy. In the in the in the union, he just uh, stood there like a crazy person and improvised for about forty minutes, and I was completely blown away. Yeah. Um. And so that you know that that sort of thing really always stuck in my head. Um. I I for years was you know. Uh, what's called a new music pianist and did all this avant-garde classical stuff that was too hard for most people to play and sort of got my career started that way. That's interesting also, all, the same way Richard Ronnie Bennett started. He he was, he was studied with Boulez and was the first guy to play the Boulez second sonata, which is impossible in England. Um, but uh, as I got further along in my career, I, I realized that, you know, my first love, uh was american popular song you know when i when i was a kid i would sit in the basement and play uh, this old piano we had and we had stacks of, of of sheet music old man river you know songs from uh carousel all this and i would you know as this eight-year-old iowa kid i would sit and play these songs and they all spoke to me i didn't have a clue what i was playing i didn't know from broadway i didn't know from musicals but, but this music all spoke to me and I just, I've loved it ever since then. And yeah. So there's, it's, I don't know what it is about these ch childhood passions, but they kick in. And if you're lucky enough to get one, they stay with you your whole life. That's such a great quote. So of all of the things that you do, you're a musician, you're an arranger, you're a composer, you got a lot going on. What do you look forward to the most every day you wake up? and you do your thing, what is it that really fuels you? You know, I, uh, I love doing arrangements. I don't, I, and you know, even the sort of, um, uh, the, just the sort of drudgery of standing at the computer and notating everything in, I just, I, I actually do enjoy arranging. I also enjoy, try and sit at the piano every day and, you know, play and practice some, just depending. 
I'm not so good about doing that, but uh, I used to practice like a maniac, but uh, now just whenever something's coming up, same thing with the conducting things, you know, it's just, you know, if I have a, a gig coming up, I'll get ready for it. But on a day-to-day -day thing, I, will, I really love doing arrangements and orchestrations and projects down the road. I've got a couple more recording projects. We're just starting to get going on now. So of all of these years and things that you've done, you've accumulated this wisdom and this insight. What do you try to impart onto young players and musicians and minds that get around you? Oh, I, that's, that's a great question. I, I, I think it's really important for young players to realize that um, they've got to make it happen for themselves. Um, that no matter how talented you are, um, you've, you've got to really put it out there in a sense and, and keep striving. And, uh, and in that same context, don't be afraid of making mistakes. Uh, the, the, the most important thing we do is, is, is to stumble because only by stumbling do you learn anything. If you go out and do something perfect, nothing happens but if 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 you if you have a problem or a, some sort of failure just don't be afraid of it embrace it and and learn from it it's terribly painful and it's very hard to get used to but but you have to you have to be, be willing to embrace not doing well because if, if you i mean believe me if learning to become a conductor it's just one string of failures, one after another. As a young conductor, you know, you're, there's no way to practice conducting except in front of the orchestra. And of course, their combined experience is a thousand times more than you. They know it, you know it, and you're you're the one standing there supposed to show them what to do. And so there's there's lots of um, embarrassing moments that transpire, but that's the only way you learn to conduct. And that's the only way one learns one's art is by, by getting out there and failing and eventually learning who you are. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone out there has a perception of you, family, friends, fans, but you ultimately lead the charge. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Um, I just uh, hope to be a, a really well-rounded musician and uh, try not to be a dick. <laughs> say that on the radio you can absolutely you can <laughs> um, you know all all the all the musicians that that have sort of most admired lucas foss richard ronnie bennett um and that i've that i've worked well with they they all tend to be really rounded. i mean they were great pianists composers arrangers and in richard's case the master of all of so many styles people can't get their heads around it but but i think it's it's it, it, that's my touchstone is to be this really well-rounded musician who can do lots of things really well um it it's also uh kind of a uh, a career number because that for instance you know in in our culture especially that people like like the pigeonhole artists and 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 they're suspect of someone who's not a specialist in more than one thing. Um, but uh, for me, it's just I really enjoy being able to do lots of things musically, and I, I, I that way I'm always learning something new. You know, just playing the same old concert over and over again just doesn't really appeal to me. Yeah. So if anyone out there wants to pick up the latest project, I Watch You Sleep, anything, learning anything about what you're doing, any previous work, where's the best place to go? Well, it's 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 really everywhere. It's on Spotify. It's on uh, Apple Music. It's on, uh, you know, Amazon, wherever. It, it's available uh, as download. It's available as on CD and LP. The LP is really great looking. Of course, yeah. it's it's few tracks in the CD, but uh, it's all the big orchestral numbers. And um, 
it's generally available where, wherever you get your record CDs or, or downloads at Barnes and Noble, you name it. So uh, we've been very pleased with the way it's going. And uh, I'm, I'm just crazy about it. The, the title track, um, I Watch You Sleep is another one of these songs that I thought should be better known. It's it, it's a, the love theme from a 1979 film called Yanks that starred Richard Gere. Yeah. And Shirley Horn and a few other people have recorded it, but it really hasn't become the standard that I think it should. I think it's a great song. And, and in honor of Shirley Horn, I, for Claire, I made this sort of floating string arrangement with no rhythm section, which of course drove Claire crazy, but yeah. uh, it was a good stretch for her. And, and uh, I think it turned out really beautifully. Yeah, it's a wonderful album. Scott, this has been great. Thank you so much for opening up. Thank you for your story and your time today. Joe, thank you. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. Before